All right, we'll go ahead and get started, given that apparently we're already late. Don't worry, I'll keep it short. So hi, my name is Victor. I'm a software engineer at Google. I work into, in the containers infrastructure team. I'm part of the team that runs all the containers across all machines at Google. Uh, it's an interesting job, uh, but thankfully I only have to worry about the user space side, so sorry for you guys that have to actually make the stuff underneath work. Um, given that I was asked to come here and talk a little bit about how we set up uh, networking on our side, on user space, so I'll be talking a little bit about how we set up containers uh, on the actual machines as well as how do we set up clusters of containers, how do those things route and network to each other. Um, so the talk will be a little bit different from the other ones you've heard, given that will be a lot less technical, much more of a use case. Uh, but hopefully it will be useful material. And please point out anything that we're doing incorrectly. Uh, I'm sure that we're doing plenty of those things and we'd be happy to fix them. So the first thing I want to talk about is what containers are, not really because I don't expect anyone to know, but because everybody has their own definition. Uh, so in general, we all agree that they're like these lightweight VMs where they allow some form of virtualization without the overhead of the hypervisor. I generally just like to say that we're able to isolate the resources, namespaces, file systems, and capabilities of a machine. Uh, and show that one unique view to uh, an application. And so specifically today, since this is a networking conference, we'll talk about networking. And the two big aspects of networking on, um, actually I guess there's three big aspects of networking uh, when it comes to containers are two namespaces, UTS, primarily doing host name isolation, uh, and the network namespace, which gives you literally an entire uh, network stack uh, available to you, and you can customize it however you like. Uh, the third one is the C group, uh, the net C groups. We don't really talk much about those today because they're actually not particularly used uh, in the things that I'll be talking about today. There are certain applications that do use them. We do use them in Google, um, but a lot of the open source stuff that we'll be talking about don't use it yet. And so when I talk about containers today, I'm really going to be talking about Docker and kind of everybody now is all excited about Docker and everybody, everything you hear about containers is Docker. And I think the primary reason for that is that Docker has made it very easy to package applications and file systems and ship those around. And that turned out to be a problem that a lot of people had. And while all the container people kind of, you know, bunched up to that and said, well, we can also do all these other things um, that many people don't quite know that they want yet, uh, but they're getting for free anyway. So Docker is an open source project. It's written entirely in Go. You'll find that is a common trend amongst all the things I'll talk about today. And it promises to be hardware and platform agnostic. So far, it's done a pretty good job of both. Uh, they're actually porting it right now to ARM and things like PPC. So those will be interesting to see. I will also be specifically talking about a lower layer of Docker called libcontainer. So libcontainer is uh, similar to what you might see something like LXC. It is a container runtime. It implements containers on top of the kernel. This is written also primarily in Go with a bunch of stuff in C. It is very, very, very interesting to try to write things right on top of the kernel in Go. Uh, you quickly run into the limitations of the Go runtime uh, and then trying to circumvent those is uh, an act of its own. Uh, and so today when we talk about containers, we'll be talking about Docker containers built with libcontainer specifically. And that's actually the container abstraction we'll be using. And so networking in Docker is actually relatively simple. Uh, through time, it's gotten more and more complicated. And this is actually one of the parts where everybody kind of wants to have their own way that they set up their own networking and everybody's data center is different. So we've actually run into a lot of issues and are working very heavily to make it uh, customizable. But in general, the rough things that we allow today uh, Net, uh, host name as well as networks and routes. What network we mean is how we actually get exposed to uh, the outside world, how everybody can address the container and how the container exposes its services to the outside world. As well as routes, how do we actually route the traffic to and from the container? Uh, and we'll talk about each of those in turn. So Docker very roughly tries to give these large ideas of strategies. So kind of it tries to give you uh, pre-made networking setups that you can use. Uh, there's four main ones that I'll talk about today. Uh, so the first one is loopback. Uh, this is sort of the no-op strategy, primarily used for containers that don't need any networking because it just has a loopback interface, nothing else. Nothing else is exposed outside of the network. The next one is the VF strategy. So this is actually the most popular given that it is the default strategy. So this is what most Docker containers use today uh, with a few exceptions. And generally what it does is what we'll see on the right side of the screen where we create a VF pair, we put one uh, end of the pipe inside the container, uh, the other end outside of the namespaces, and we hook it up to the Docker bridge. And this bridge is itself connected to ES0 or wherever you're getting your networking from. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what those things do. 
One of the things that we have noticed is that we have a significant performance degradation from this. We've measured it to be about 50% of what some of the other strategies are uh, today. So for a lot of the users of Docker, they don't particularly care. It's not a problem yet. Um, but we found it to be a big problem in a lot of our use cases. And so, by the way, feel free to ask any questions anytime. Uh, so looking at the VS strategy in general, looking at how connections coming in. Uh, so again, we have these uh, this ES0 connected to the bridge and the bridge itself uh, connected to the actual containers. So uh, by default, all communication to the containers is blocked uh, through all ports. Uh, the only way that we ever get any information incoming uh, is if the container itself asks for a port to be exposed. And so what we'll do is that we'll map a port from the container, for example, map port 80 to the host 6473. And so any request coming to the host on 6473 actually gets exposed to the container. Otherwise, the container has no way to accept incoming traffic. Going out, it's a little different. The, the container pretty much masquerades as the host in order to be able to reach the rest of the internet. If a container wants to talk to another container on the same machine, that traffic is actually itself blocked. The only way that you address another container is the same way that you would address any Docker container on the network. You'd have to go through the host uh, and then down through the map port all the way down. And we'll talk a little bit about what we do in other places since this kind of is not a very good starting point for a lot of applications. And so the last two strategies I wanted to talk about, uh, one of them is the NetNS strategy, which in essence is I want to use that guy's network namespaces. It allows you to share network namespaces between containers. Sort of sounds innocuous, but uh, there's two very large use cases. One, which we'll talk about the second half of the presentation. And the big one is that you can actually say, hey, I want to use that guy's network namespace and, that, and, and those being the host's network namespace. This is heavily used by a lot of people who don't want to pay that performance penalty, because at that point you do get the native performance you come to expect. Uh, although at this point you are pretty much exposing your container and all its ports. You can get into a lot of issues where two containers try to bind to the same port. Um, if you can manage your network that way, it turns out pretty well. If you don't have that much discipline, it doesn't work as well. The last strategy I wanted to talk about is the VLAN, both uh, Mac VLAN as well as IP VLAN uh, coming soon. Uh, there was a talk earlier today about IP VLAN. We're particularly very, very excited, and we'll talk more about it on the second half as to why that's the case. But this is something that's currently in the works and adding this actual driver. This is something that's deemed necessary uh, for terms of performance. And so some of the things that uh, the Docker world is working on right now, as I mentioned, is definitely making things much more pluggable. Uh, every other day, we, there is a complaint about some networking strategy not being sufficient. Um, and so we're really working on trying to make that as pluggable as possible so people can run their own networks the way they'd like to. Uh, also performance, as I mentioned before, Mac VLAN and IP VLAN are top of our list. And uh, native support for Checkpoint Restore, uh, so primarily using Creo. There's a lot of very uh, late work into that. I think we'll be uh, getting that uh, very soon, which allows us to do other interesting things related to migration and such. So the second half of the presentation that I wanted to talk about uh, is something that's particularly interesting to me. Uh, so this is uh, networking and container clusters. When we talk about container clusters, generally we talk about clusters, data centers, things like the, that look like this. So this is actually a picture inside uh, one of Google's data centers, just a very large row of machines, cluster in general, one set of aggregate compute that we can address and make usable uh, for our needs, usually very tightly packed in terms of network. Uh, you have very fast connection between any of those given machines. This is actually a really nice picture to see at night, if for whatever reason you're alone in a data center at night. Um, because uh, th all of these do have their own LEDs, uh, and it's, it's a very nice sight. Um, uh, and so Google has been running container clusters for a very long time. We usually say about 10, uh, 11 years. I have a sticker here of the 10th anniversary of our cluster management system that manages containers. And so we've been running containers in some form or another for a very long time. And you know, we, we think that sort of we, we do it relatively well, at least, you know, well enough to convince ourselves that we should talk about it publicly. Uh, and so we want to talk about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is a project that we released open source a little over six months ago. What this is, is it builds on top of everything that we've done inside Google. Of After running these systems for such a long time, we decided, hey, look, there's these set of abstractions that we think are interesting. There's these set of things that we think would be useful to the outside world. Let's talk about them, uh, and let's get people excited about this. And so Kubernetes uh, is Greek for helmsman or governor. It was the only word that we could find that wasn't trademarked and still uh, pronounceable, so that's how we got the name. 
so this is itself a container orchestrator. This is a system, a way that you run your systems with certain abstractions in order to manage large amounts of compute and be able to address schedule and run workloads on top of it. Uh, as I mentioned, it's open source and also written in Go. Uh, and it's uh, primarily targeted at, uh, the tagline we always say is that you want to manage your applications, not your machines. And the thing that we always try to say is about the difference between pet and cattle. Of like, pet is something you take care of, you give a name, you worry about. Cattle is something you shoot and kill when they get sick. And so we try to think of our compute as cattle as opposed to pet. If one of them comes and goes, that's okay. The infrastructure will handle that and will take care of making sure that our system works in general, instead of having to manually care and prune for each one of our instances. And so in general, at a 10,000 uh, feet view, this is what a Kubernetes cluster looks like, happy faces and all. So we'll have some users on the left side trying to do useful work through whatever means we allow them API, CLI, UI. On the right side, we have a large number of, of compute nodes each of these is running the Kubernetes agent, which we call the kubelet. Uh, this agent is in talks with what we call the Kubernetes master. The master is a node or a replicated set of nodes that run a set of resources um, that allow it to run the actual cluster. So in this example, we have the API server, actually exposes all the endpoints, and it's what everybody talks to. And then the scheduler, which is a component that, as the name implies, schedules work units on each of the machines. Things that you won't see here are things like management of machines, management of the actual schedulable units. If any of them go down, we need to reschedule them. We need to make sure that uh, the machines are up and running as we expect them to be. And so there's two key abstractions in Kubernetes that I want to talk about, uh, both because they're important to Kubernetes as well as because they're the ones that are interesting in the terms of networking. Uh, so the first one of these is pods, and as the name would imply, you know, P, uh, peas in a pod or a pod of whales. It's a small group of containers. It's a group of containers that are tightly knit. So these are containers that you run on the same machine, you co-schedule them. So generally we say that they share the same fate, they share the same resources. So this wouldn't be like your front end and your back end. This would be something like the example we have here where you have a web server and a file syncer. So your web server serves static contents and we have something that grabs that static content from some distributed storage and periodically updates the web server so it's updating that. These are two things that if they were not to both run at the same time together, it wouldn't make sense to run them. Our front ends and our back ends, we can load balance them separately and scale them separately so they don't necessarily need to run in a pod. And so this is the scheduling atom in Kubernetes. Whenever we talk about anything that we run, anything that we schedule, it's a pod. It's the thing uh, that we always talk about. And so things with, within, a, within a pod do share a lot of things. Uh, what's relevant here is that they do share a network namespace. So within themselves, they refer to their, they can talk to each other as local host. They share the port address space and they share one single IP address, which is writable. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So probably the most interesting part about pods um, is that they themselves have each an IP. And this is an IP that is routable by the network fabric on the data center. So by default, Docker usually doesn't give you an IP. You have to do weird things, go through the host, export a port. Uh, we've done that before. We built that internally. It turned out not to be a great idea. You run into all kinds of issues where uh, either depletion of pods or ports, scheduling of ports, Suddenly ports become a first class thing where you have to put it everywhere. All configuration has to specify ports. All applications have to know that I need to uh, take a port as an argument. So it's just a monstrous disaster. Uh, and if we were to do it again, we would uh, do it uh, assigning a single IP per container, which is what we chose to do uh, with Kubernetes. So again, all the nodes can talk to, all the containers can talk to each other, even across nodes, without doing any form of NAT. They are addressable, fully addressable IPs, they can talk to each other. But again, these tend to be internal IPs, so not necessarily IPs that are exposed to the internet, usually 10 dot IPs. Um, the question of how, uh, at, how we actually get uh, at network from the public internet and actually have a public IP that you expose is kind of an ongoing interesting problem, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the second abstraction I wanted to talk about was services. And uh, the important thing to learn about services is why they exist at all. So as I was talking about pods being these cattle that we just kill at any time, uh, we refer to pods being ephemeral, being one pod is replaceable for another pod, given that they both have the same abstraction, the same contract, the same API. But it doesn't matter whether it's this one or that one. They may go away, a machine might entirely go down, and so we have some other machine who brought up the pods. Um, or one of those pods may just be bad and we'll need to start to route our traffic to another one. Uh, either way, we 
we shouldn't, we, we argue that it is incorrect for us to address a single pod by its IP, both because it might go away as well as it might run into issues. And so we've created the service abstraction to do this. So instead of you actually addressing a pod whose, again, IP might go away or its uh, essence might go away, you address a service, which is an abstraction similar to what you might have a load balancer in front of a, of a set of pods. So as the as we showed here, you might have three pods behind this uh, load balancer. And then this load balancer will ahead again understand which nodes are happy, which nodes are not, which ones are ready to serve, which ones are not ready to serve, and can uh, move the traffic accordingly. The interesting thing about a, a service is that a service does have a stable IP. This is a, an IP that, uh, unlike the IP of a pod, is guaranteed to exist, is guaranteed to continue, uh, and is guaranteed to be used by all the clients. And so the couple quick questions. Yes, sir. Um, the first is, uh, you mentioned that pod IPs are routable, um, and that each pod has its own IP. I assume that this is based off of the physical topology of the cluster? Yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more about the, the setup on this. So there's, uh, well, okay. we have a, a few ways that you can actually get this done. We do it with an SDN, which you have built on top of our fabric. People have started to do it with uh, UDP and CAP uh, systems built on top. So that actually was the first, the hardest thing to get people into right. Kubernetes. Uh, cool, and then the other question is, um, the service IPs, I imagine that they move a lot more. If you're using the SDN solution, then is it the same address space, or do you carve out different, like a different prefix for all of your service IPs? Yeah, so we will carve out a different uh, prefix for the service IPs. And so those will, will be guaranteed to be more static. And you know, we'll, we'll go into a little more detail about it in a little bit. So. Uh, back to services. So the way that uh, you would look at uh, how connections are done with services, it's it's a little interesting. We're working on optimizing it. Uh, but in essence, we have some client. Uh, I'm one pod on the Kubernetes cluster, and I want to talk to another. To want to talk to a service. Uh, somehow I look up the IP of that service. I'm going to go ahead and hit it. Uh, and then on the actual Kubernetes node that I'm running on, we actually do IP tables DNAT, where we get, oh, you're actually wanting to talk to this. Thing which is we know is a service, we're actually going to reroute you to what we call the cube proxy. This is a proxy running on every Kubernetes node that is an enlightened proxy. It knows, oh, this service is actually backed by these number of pods. I'm going to go ahead and route you to one of those. So what the cube proxy does is that it places a watch on the API server. What this means is that it knows the constituency of those services. So it understands what pods are active and what pods are ready to serve uh, as part of this service and then it goes ahead and routes between that. Today, it does a super awesome, super advanced round robbing um, load balancing. So as you can see, there's definitely some room to grow. Um, but uh, this turns out to work very well in practice. We haven't noticed a significant performance degradation, although we haven't tried extensively well. In the few tests that we have run, it actually does better because the proxy uh, batches a lot of the packets. Um, so um, we're sure that it, it doesn't actually make it better, uh, but we haven't really seen uh, a problem in practice today. And so one of the questions that always comes up is how do you actually discover uh, these service IPs? Uh, and of course, uh, we came up with two different solutions. Uh, the first one we started with was clearly awesome and super scalable, which was just to place a bunch of environment variables into the container to tell you exactly what things were. So if you're looking for the Kubernetes read-only service, it's on this IP, or the foo service, it's on that IP. Um, so that we knew wasn't going to scale, but at least it got us a, a foothold in, in the beginning. Uh, right now, we just finished rolling out a, an internal cluster DNS where we can actually, uh, you can actually do a lookup on the service by the service name, and we'll return the IP. This is the IP of the service, not the IP of any of the pods underneath it. The routing will still do uh, the same way that we did before. And again, this tends to work very well in practice because the service IPs are stable IPs. And so talking a little bit more to the question that was asked about the configurations that we have. In general, in Kubernetes, uh, setting up this networking is slightly complicated. In the beginning, a lot of people didn't think that they could do it outside of the first initial implementation we had. Uh, but then we, uh, we were able to get a couple new uh, configurations coming in. So the first one uh, that we developed was based on Andromeda. So Andromeda is Google Software Defined Networking. This is what we actually expose as part of Google Compute Engine, our, uh, compute, our public compute services, our public cloud. And so this allows you to program, to program the underlying uh, fabric uh, 
pretty rudimentary. You can do sort of a, a few set of things, but it turns out to be s extremely powerful in practice and works well for us. Um, the second option that's available is CoreOS, who's a big partner on Kubernetes, uh, wrote this UDP NCAP, or U this UDP NCAP overlay network called Flannel. Uh, so I know Tom was just here talking about UDP network, UDP NCAP. Uh, so they did something similar, and they, they have even more ability to program the network than we do. Um, we being Andromeda. So what we tend to do, uh, as I mentioned, is that we do carve the service IPs out of their own 10 dot address space. Uh, for the rest of it, we actually give a slash 24 uh, for each of the nodes. So each of the nodes itself has 256 IPs that it can distribute to the containers. Hasn't yet been a problem. We have yet to, a lot of things break before you get anywhere close to 256 containers uh, per node. Uh, so, so far has not been an issue. Uh, but car how we actually carve out this uh, address space has been an issue on the number of nodes that we're able to scale in the cluster. And so we're actively working on that. Other configurations that are not uh, particularly well supported today but uh, are in the works, uh, there's a couple of people working on OVS-based solutions. And I guess Andromeda would be similar to that in some ways. And uh, there's also a few other companies doing different types of overlay uh, networks built on top of that. Uh, so we're also seeing how some of that ends up. And so future work, as I mentioned, um, migratable IPs. Uh, so today, we see that we carve out the, the slash 24s per machine. So this works out great. We can give each container an IP. But this is not an IP I can migrate. So once I can actually have my container be checkpoint restorable, I can't actually move it to another machine because I can't migrate its IP. I can argue that I can kill the pod and start it somewhere else. But then some people get upset. I just did all this computation, and you just killed me. Can you please just move me? Um, so we're very much working on that, and we don't have quite a solution today. Uh, the, sec uh, the third thing uh, on the slide is real load balancing. So again, we, today we just do very naive round robin. At least we know the constituency of our services. But we definitely want to do something that understands the state of the cluster, understands the utilization of the nodes, whether the nodes are healthy, uh, what needs to happen there. And the, the first point on the slide, something I haven't touched at all on the presentation, because it's something that we haven't quite had a problem with, is actually network resource management. So capping how much a container can put in, uh, can send to the network and receive from the network, uh, both doing this at the level of a single node, so we don't saturate the NIC, as well as at the level of the cluster, so we don't overload the, any, any of the flows or the switches in the cluster. This is all sort of future work and super dependent on your network topology, so we're not particularly looking forward to addressing that one just yet. Uh, with that, uh, this is a picture of it at night, so it is, it is quite interesting. Uh, but if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. So initially, you mentioned the VTH use case in MacVillan, and you said that the VTH use case has a performance integration degradation, which relates to what to the IP tables that involved. So I'd be lying to you if I knew if I told you I knew offhand what it was. Um, can you go back to the slide that uh, I also haven't managed to? I might just answer this question. So VE uh, means uh, a loop through the routing table. So you basically re-enter the IP stack. Can can, can we That's see it? And what's the difference between the VS use case to the Mac VLAN and what? How does IP VLAN? Can you explain it a bit more here in this context? So in the Vith uh, case, uh, any packets you send from the network namespace have to go through the IP forwarding uh, path. So that's why it's more expensive than just a plan. Uh, the packet the, the, you you expose to the container a Vith interface, right? Yeah. And they. So so you expose a pair of Vith. So one leg is in the network namespace, and the other leg uh, lands in the initial net network namespace. That's why you need the uh, routing. Yes, I know. I know. Um, well, uh, um, what Eric mentioned, and also the fact that Vith isn't hardware, so any of the nice hardware offloads you, you, you get on, on a modern NIC don't exist. Thank you for asking me. I'm more confused than I was before I asked the question. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a namespace expert, but Mac VLAN offloads from hardware. You go from the physical, boom, you land onto the container, If depending on the mode you set. VETH, you have to send the packet through ETH to the stack, then it gets copied over to the container. So there's more steps. Yeah. But if the Mac, so if the Mac VLAN or IP VLAN is applicable to this case, why not just use it? 
Uh, okay, maybe answer that question. <laughs> so your question was why not use it? We simply haven't piped in support for it yet. There's no other reason. I, I began just landed in, in the Linux kernel. Uh, it was just mainline. A lot of this is to work on other. That does not fit here. You must use the IP VLAN. So you, I think you obviously <laughs> missed my presentation earlier. <laughs> So the thing is, we cannot use Mac VLAN because we cannot explode the number of MAC addresses on the network. Uh, we are tied to using one MAC address per host. That's why. So part of that, part of that is the limitation on our SDN. Uh, part of the reason why we prefer IP VLAN to Mac VLAN. <coughs> um, okay, so I've been uh, looking at Kubernetes for a couple of months, uh, Red Hat, um, and I noticed in your presentation as well, it seems like there's certainly a, 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 at least a bias and maybe a total, uh, uh, towards IPv4, maybe even a total, totally ignoring IPv6 within Kubernetes. Whereas over the past several days, I've seen presentations from Tom and Eric, maybe some other Google, uh, other Google folks, and all they're talking about is IPv6. And that seems like a disconnect. I wonder if you could address that. Yeah, so that's actually something we're working on right now. Uh, I know the, the, the excuse that we will use is that, uh, so we primarily develop on top of Andromeda. Um, and what's exposed today for GCE, we don't really have a lot of um, support for IPv6 just yet. Uh, so a lot of that is coming. And sort of until we can run it ourselves, we're going to have a hard time going outside of that. But I do agree with you. We do have a very heavy IPv4 emphasis today. But we're actually getting a lot of pushback on getting IPv6 very soon. So I'll, I, I very much expect to see that changing in the near future. Yeah, IPVLAN uh, works on IPv6. This is the primary target. IPv4 is working, but not very efficiently. So one question is, uh, if the service discovery is uh, where you resolve the IP addresses of the source and destinations, how do other tools like TC or any of the policy tools uh, know what, how to apply policies on? Uh, do you also extend the endpoint kind of inside those policy layers? Maybe I'm not understanding your question. I'm sorry. So until the service discovery happens, you don't really know what will be the fire to pull on okay. the wire. Is that right? So until you, the, you don't know what the destination is until after service discovery? Right. So today, uh, the, we have like the legacy applications that don't know anything about Kubernetes, and they run through the Kubernetes proxy. Uh, that turns out to work very well in practice. We can route things without things being Kubernetes native. Uh, you can do the same thing that the kube proxy does today, where you can actually do the watching yourself and then directly connect to one of the nodes. We don't block any of that from happening. We actually, so today we use the Kubernetes proxy, but uh, we've been looking at just doing it straight through, through IP table rules. And there's a way to do it, it's just been, uh, there's plenty of other fires to fight for right now. Um, but yes, this is definitely something you can do natively. We won't ever block you actually talking to another node directly. Um, but uh, we find most applications don't even want to bother with it, and so that's why the proxy exists today. For performance sensitive applications, which is always a complaint we get, they will do the, the lookups themselves. Um, I got very interested on you on that last bullet point on the last slide, um, resource management. And um, obviously, the difficulty is uh, translating the intent into or the, the, or the, the operational constraints without being specific to the hardware or the, the, the infrastructure in general, do you already have an idea on how to capture that resource management constraints, um, intent base or something like that, and, and how to translate that into um, infra infrastructure specific um, com configuration? Yeah, so uh, I will have a very sad answer that we don't unfortunately have any answers today. This is an area that we know uh, we have work to do because a lot of, so we tend to not worry too much about the network, uh, but under certain, uh, a lot of uh, other data centers do have a, an issue with networking. Uh, and so that's something that we actually don't have much of an answer for today. Sorry, this might be like a dupe, and I can definitely just look at the code to figure it out. But your proxy, that's a layer seven proxy, just doing like regular TCP termination, connection yep. forwarding. So is it application specific at all? Does it like cool into RPC protocol? Okay, so no, it's no, just it completely should be super general, super simple, nothing special. Okay, cool. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm actually continuing the same uh, this um, proxy question. So that's a proxy in user space written in Go, right? Yes. And so all of the connections, all the GCP connections actually establish into itself on a local host, and then it's load balance in a round robin way, right? So okay. uh, did you measure performance, or are you saying like at this point you don't care, like for so this, yeah, all the extra stuff that's happening? We haven't done extensive performance uh, tests. We do expect there to be some degradation. The simple test that we did actually performed better with the proxy because the proxy was doing batching of the packets, uh, but we don't actually expect those to be real numbers. Um, so. In short, we haven't really found, uh, in practice, we haven't found an issue yet, uh, but we need to run more uh, performance tests on that. But again, we do hope to change this, so because performance at, at that level has not yet been an issue, uh, we haven't addressed it, but we do have plans, again, going straight through IP table rules that we should get rid uh, of the proxying itself, and we should uh, bring the performance down within an acceptable level. Or I guess performance back to an acceptable level. Thank you.